In the name of God the Gracious, the Merciful, all praises to God and peace be upon His servants whom He chose. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today's topic is about the shape of the earth in the Quran. I've been recently noticing a lot of debates going on in regards to whether the Quran mentions that the earth is a globe or does it say that it's actually flat. And so today I would like to share with you my thoughts in regard in regarding this topic. But before delving into this, I'd like to say a few things. First of all, there seems to be this general attitude in these debates of anyone who disagrees with my understanding of the Quran is going to hell. And I would like to say that God is the judge, not you or I. And carrying this type of attitude is what really leads to extremism. And we need to be very cognizant of this. God is the judge, not you or I. And whether you understand something from the Quran differently from another person, we need to be mindful of the fact that not everyone will have the same understanding of the Quran. In 2217, God makes it explicitly clear that he will judge between us on the day of resurrection. I personally do not see that whether you believe in a globe or a flat earth, that has no impact to your salvation. The second thing I'd like to mention is that science is not a belief system because it seems to me, again, based on my experience, that those who believe that the earth is flat have a problem with science as if it's the antithesis of uh, Islam or uh, spirituality or religion. It has nothing to do with these things. Science is simply a meticulous study or experimentation of something. And in fact, the Quran encourages us to use our minds to be scientists somewhat, like in Surah 29 verse 20. There's also certain key words that are used throughout the Quran that tells us that God encourages us to use our minds. And the idea or the notion of scientists are anti-religion is absolutely incorrect. Like this gentleman, Dr. Martin Rees, he's an astrophysicist and he absolutely believes in God and yet he is a scientist. Likewise for Dr. Francis Collins, a geneticist, he also believes in God and yet he is a scientist. So this idea that you cannot be a scientist and also believe in God is absolutely incorrect. It has nothing to do, they have nothing to do with each other. So we need to be mindful of these two facts. So let's get right to it. Let's talk about the shape of the earth in the Quran. I went on a website called Wiki Islam and I found an article that talks about or claims of the flat earth in the Quran. And these are the verses that they listed out for us. And according to the article, these Arabic keywords in red all indicate flatness of the earth. But when I read these verses in the Arabic text, I do not see any shape or holistic shape of the earth. So let me repeat, these verses do not talk about the shape of the earth, not flat, not globe. God here is simply talking about the habitable conditions of the earth. And I will we will get into each of these verses, but just generally speaking, without even translating these key words, if we read these verses based on their context, we will see that God is simply talking about the habitable conditions of the earth, and they have nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth. And I apologize for misleading you with the title of this video, but this is what really I want to talk about. These verses have nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth, but rather the habitable conditions of the earth. There seems to be two primary problems as to why these verses have been misunderstood. The first problem is an incorrect definition, thus resulting in an incorrect translation. And let me give you an example. Like in Surah 22 verse 5, God talks about the creation of the human being. He says, then from an embryo, then from a mudra. The Arabic word mudra, at a very, very surface translation definition, would mean something that is chewed. Now, the question is, is God saying that the human being is chewed? Of course not. The problem is that we need to really delve into the root definition, finding the root definition, so that we know exactly what God is talking about. The Arabic word for mudra, the root definition, simply means an unknown shape. So God here is talking about an unknown shape, something that is formed in a weird mixture that makes it look like it's chewed. But ultimately, the root definition is unknown shape. Likewise, when we look at these verses about the supposed flat earth, or globe earth for that fact, these 
terms, in my experience, they tend to be translated or defined in a, at a very surface level. We need to focus on the root definition, which will enable us to understand exactly what God is talking about. Now, the second problem is confirmation bias. If you have a problem with science, if you have a problem with uh, uh, NASA or whoever, then there's a very, very high likelihood of reading these verses in a confirmation bias method. And again, we need to be cognizant of that. So these are the two primary problems that I see when people are attempting to quote these verses to say, hey, the earth is flat. So let's start digging into these verses. The first thing I want to demonstrate for you is that even without defining these Arabic key terms, reading the context will give you a general idea as to what God is talking about. Again, God here is talking about the habitable conditions of the earth, not the holistic shape of the earth. 22, uh, Surah 2 verse 22, the one who made the earth a firashan and the sky a shelter and he sent down from the sky water with which he brought out fruits as a gift to you. 1519, and the land we have madadnaha and placed stabilizers in it and we have planted in it everything in balance. Ask yourself, is God talking about the flatness of the entire earth or is God simply talking about the habitable conditions of the earth? Read the context. 2053, the one who made for you the earth Mahdan, and he made ways for you in it, and he brought down water from the skies, so we brought out with it pairs of vegetation of all types. And God made the land for you a Bisatan, so that you may seek in it ways and paths. And the land after that he Dahaha, he brought forth from its water and pasture, and the mounds he fixed firmly. Will they not look at the camels, how they were created, and to the land, how it was sutihat, and the heaven and what he built, and the earth and what he tahaha? So again, just getting this general gist or idea, uh, the context of the verse, without even translating what God is, uh, the, these Arabic key words, we see that God is simply talking about the general idea of the habitable conditions of the earth. Also, I noticed that in this article uh, on the Wiki Islam, did not quote these verses. Like in 4064, God is the one who made the earth qararan, qararan, a habitat for you, and the heaven a structure he designed you and he perfected your design. So the word Arabic word qararan means a type of settlement. Likewise, in 2761, the one who made the earth a qararan. And he made in it rivers and he made for it stabilizers. What about this verse, 6715? He is the one who made the earth the lulan for you, a subservient for you. These verses have nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth. It's just simply talking about the habitable conditions of the earth. Now, let's dig into each of these verses and dissect them. Surah 2 verse 22. God says the one who made the earth a firashan. The key word here is firashan, which is typically translated, again, from a very surface rendition as a carpet. And to some people, the carpet implies that the entire earth is flat, because you can lay carpet only on a flat surface. And unfortunately, they have missed the point in its entirety. The reason why God uses firashan is because it comes from the root word farasha. And farasha means to spread something over something else, specifically for comfort and to live upon. In Arabic, when we ask whether a house or an apartment is furnished, we ask if it's mafrush. We're not asking if it's flat. We're asking if it has furniture in it because so that we can live upon the furniture we can be comfortable on the furniture and this is also why we call butterflies and moths as farash because when these lay on the earth when they lay on the ground all together they look like something that you can live upon and this is specifically why god God calls the earth firashan because he let he made it a habitat for us to live upon comfortably. It has nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth, but rather the way God made the earth for us as a place for us, a habitat to live upon comfortably. So I would render firashan as furnish. 
It's furnished in the sense that God provided everything for you to live upon on the earth. It has nothing to do with the flatness of the entirety of the earth. Nothing. To reinforce this idea, look at Surah 51 verse 48, where God says, And the earth we furnished it. God here is using the same term that is being used in 2.22. 20, uh, God says, and the earth we furnished it, so glory to the mahidun. So the result of it being furnished is mahidun. The Arabic word mahidun comes from mahada, which means a place of habitation. So again, the result of being furnished is habitation, and therefore furnished means, simply refers to the habitat of the earth. It has nothing to do with the flatness of the earth. The next verse is Surah 15, verse 19, where God says, And the land, or the earth, we have madadnaha. Madadnaha does not mean flattened. Madadnaha comes from the root word madda, which means to extend something in quality, quantity, or time. And in the Quran, we see the usage of this term, like in 7202, where it says, But their brethren, yamuddunahum, extend to them relentlessly into error. Or in 2355, do they assume that namudduhum, we extend to them with wealth and children? 9.4, so fulfill the treaty with them to the muddatihim, their extended time. These verses have nothing to do with flatness of the earth, but rather quality, quantity, or time. Extension of quality, quantity, or time. And so when God talks about the earth or the land being extended, madadanaha, he's talking about the habitable conditions. It's, it's extended. You can travel upon it. Even by reading the, the context, you can see exactly that God is talking about the habitable conditions of the earth. So I would render Madadnaha extended it, not in the sense that it's holistically flat, but rather extended it in the sense that it's a, a place of habitation, a place that you can travel upon. The next verse is Surah 20, verse 53, where God says, The one who made for you the earth, Mahdan. Mahdan has nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth. It comes from the root word Mahada, which means preparing a place specifically suitable for living. This is why in 5148, God says, And the earth we furnished it, so glory to the Mahidun, preparers of habitation. God also calls a cradle as a Mahd because the baby lives upon it. And in 2206, it says, Hell shall be sufficient for him. What a miserable mihad, a place that they live in. So mahdan has nothing to do with the shape of the earth, but rather the habitable condition of the earth, a habitat. And again, reading the context, the one who made for you the earth a habitat, and he traced out paths for you in it, and he brought down water from the sky, so, brought, so we brought out with it pairs of vegetation of all types. Reading on, eat and raise your lay, livestock, in that are signs for those with thought. From it we created you, and in it we return you, and from it we bring you out another time. Again, talking about the habitable conditions of the earth. The next verse is Surah 71, verse 19, where God says, And God made the land or earth for you as a bisatan. And people read bisatan and say, Wow, this means flatness. No, it does not. Basata, the root word is basata, which means to distribute something with ease. This is why in Surah 2, verse 245, it says, God collects and he yupsat distributes. The distribution here has nothing to do with the flatness of the earth, but rather the distribution of the habitable conditions of the earth. And again, by reading the context, we can see this. The next verse says, so that you may seek in it ways and paths. God says, and God made the land or earth for you as a distribute, so that you may seek in it ways and paths. The so here, the land that is used in the original Arabic text, indicates a pure reason as to why it is distributed, so that you may seek in it ways and paths. This is all that God is talking about, the habitable conditions of the earth that you may, that he distributed it so that you may seek ways in it and paths. The next verse is Surah 79 verse 30, where God says, And the land or earth, after that, he dahaha. And it's quite interesting that both sides of the debate would quote this verse to justify the shape of the earth. 
But again, this verse is not talking about the shape of the earth. Dahaha comes from the root word dahawa, which means to spread and compress something. And an ostrich, when it wants to build the nest to lay the eggs, it spreads and compresses the earth and places the eggs on top of that. So when God tells us that he dahaha of the land or the earth, it's in the sense of making it a habitat for us, just like those eggs. And again, context, context, context. God says, and the land after that he spread it. He brought forth from its water and pasture. So it's through this dahaha process, the spreading it process, that the waters came out and the pastures came out. And the mountains he fixed firmly. And this is to be a provision for you and your livestock. The habitable conditions of the earth. Nothing to do with the shape of the earth. The next verse is Surah 88 verse 20, where God says, And to the land how was it sultihat? And people read sultihat and say, Ah, God here is saying that the entire earth is flat. Incorrect. Sultihat comes from the root word sultaha, and yes, it refers specifically to a surface that is spread out by being leveled. In the Arabic language, when we refer to the roof of a house, it's called a sultih, not because the entire house is flat, but that the roof is this, it's referring to the surface of the house, which is the roof. Even other objects like a triangle or a circle have a satah. And so when we read the context, we get a clear understanding as to what God is asking us to do. He says, will they not look at the camels? How were they created? This can only happen from an earthly perspective. And to the sky, how was it raised? And to the mountains, how are they set? And to the land, how it was sultihat? Is God asking us to fly out into space and look down at earth? Or is God simply asking us to look from an earthly perspective? Thus, sultihat is not referring to the flatness of the entirety of the earth but rather the surface of the earth itself, again, because it's a habitat for us. That's what God is talking about. Context and understanding the root definition is vital in us uh, to understand what God is talking about. So again, all of these verses demonstrate how God here is talking about the habit habitable conditions of the earth, not the flatness of the earth. The last verse is Surah 91 verse 6 where God says, And the earth and what he tahaha. Tahaha comes from the root word tahawa, means to spread and extend something. And again, taking all the other verses in context and what God is talking about, they're all talking about the habitable conditions of the earth. Nothing to do with the holistic shape of the earth. So to briefly conclude, the verses that we have just seen have nothing to do with the shape of the earth, not globe and not flat. Rather, the verses that we have seen simply talk about the habitable conditions of the earth, just like many other verses in the Qur'an. In this next segment, we're going to address some additional Qur'anic claims made by those who believe that the earth is flat. This first claim, they say that we live under a dome, and they justify this idea from Suda 2 verse 22, where God says, the one who made the sky a construct, bina'an. And according to them, bina'an means we live under a dome. And to be frank, if, you're, if we're being honest, bina'an does not necessitate living under a dome whatsoever. Uh, the Arabic word for dome is actually qubbe which is not mentioned in the Qur'an. And if we are looking for a term in the Qur'an that may imply a dome, it's saradiq, which is mentioned in the Qur'an. But the Arabic word bina'an doesn't necessitate a dome whatsoever. God says in 4064 that he made the earth a qararan, a settlement for you, and the heaven as a construct, bina'an. It has nothing to do with a dome. But rather, just simply looking at the sky, it does look like a bina'an. It looks like a construct, not a dome. The second claim kind of tags along to the cl first claim of the dome. According to the claim, Surah 1792 talks about pieces of the dome falling upon the people. It says, or that you make the heaven fall upon us in pieces, in kisafan. Uh, 
So according to them, the kisafan is pieces of the dome. But this is incorrect. Throughout the Quran, like in Surah 30 verse 48, God tells us what exactly these kisafan are. God says, God is the one who sends the winds. They stir up clouds, then he spreads them in the sky as he wills. God is talking about the clouds. And he makes them kisafan. He makes this, the clouds kisafan, broken apart. Then you see raindrops issuing from their midst. So the kisafan here is not talking about pieces of the dome, but rather pieces of the clouds which drop rain. The third claim is that this dome has gates, and they quote Surah 7 verse 40 where it says the gates of the heavens will not open for them. But the word gates or abwab in the Quran is used both in literal and or figurative manners, like in Surah 6 verse 44. It says when they disregard what they were reminded of, we open for them the gates of all things. Another claim is that the moon emits its own light, and they quote Surah 25, verse 61, where God says, Blessed is the one who made a lamp and an illuminating moon. And according to them, the word illuminating, munira, signifies that the moon is emitting its own light. But it is not. First of all, how do they explain if the moon is emitting its own light? Uh, the waxing and the waning crescents, the phases of the moon, the new moon. How does a self-illuminating moon do these things? It doesn't. The problem is understanding what the word munira actually means. The word munira comes from the root word nawara, which means illumination. And from nawara, you have nur, which is exactly, which is light, which is exactly what munira comes from. Munira comes from nur. Then from nawara, you also have nar. Right, so from this root word, you have nur, light, you have also nar, fire. And there is a difference between the two. Like look in Surah 2 verse 17, where God says, Their example is like the one who sparks a naran, fire. So when it brightens what is around him, God takes away their nur, light. So there's a difference between fire and light. Nur, naran and nur. So you have a fire and light around it. The fire itself is called nar, whereas the light around emitted from the fire is called nur. So when God says that the moon is nur, it is quite obvious it is not emitting its own light, just like in this situation. This is why God says that he is the nur, not nar. This is why the Quran is nur, not nar. And this is why the moon is nur, not nar. So at this point, I feel that we have sufficiently addressed the verses in which it is claimed that the God is talking about a flat earth, when in reality, based on the Quran, God is not talking about the shape of the earth to begin with. In this next segment, I would like to step outside of the Quran and share with those who believe that the earth is flat, how basic observations can really teach us a lot in regards to the shape of the earth, which is a globe or a sphere. On this left side here, we see a basic flat earth map, along with a sun and a moon revolving or rotating over the earth. The earth is stationary, whereas the sun and the moon rotate above. This defies reality in all aspects, in many aspects. One thing to begin with is that if you just simply look at this map, it's highly distorted uh, at least from the southern hemisphere it is, because this is an equidistant, uh, azimuthal equidistant map. And the reason why cart cartographers have a hard time imaging maps on a flat piece of paper is because the Earth is a globe to begin with. Imaging something that is spherical onto a flat surface will always give problems to the reality. So this is a huge hint as like this uh, as to that this map in of itself is a problem. Aside from the fact of and the movement and perception of the sun and the phases in the perception of the moon, the shape and distance of objects and the co simple things like the Coriolis effect all cannot be explained scientifically on this map. Let's talk about Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world located in Dubai. 
and it's so tall that the people on the top floors during Ramadan will have to fast up to three minutes longer than those living on the bottom floors. This is because the bottom floors experience darkness or sunset first before the top floors. And the reason is very simple. It's because the earth is a globe. As the earth rotates away from the sun, the building will experience the sunset first. The bottom of the building will experience the sunset first. It's the first time of, of darkness, whereas the top still has up to three minutes. On a flat earth model, assuming that the sun is a spotlight, this is very much opposite of what happens. On a spotlight, the first darkness will actually be the top of the building, not the bottom. So again, this is something very basic that one can actually observe. An interesting tool that can be used to see how spherical the Earth is, is a sextant. It's used to find your latitude on a spherical Earth by observing the sun or stars. It's trigonometry. You aim at a celestial body and you measure it against the horizon and you get your angle, your latitude. This only works on a spherical Earth. If we are to use a flat Earth idea or, or model against, for example, Polaris, it will not work. It will simply not jive with the reality. Another thought is that the flat Earth is actually stationary. It does not move or rotate or spin. And there are many, many reasons that we know why and how that the Earth is actually spinning. One of them is simply going to a science museum, that dem and some of them will have what is called a Foucault pendulum. And this Foucault pendulum demonstrates the rotation of the Earth by swinging a weight in a fixed plane of oscillation while the Earth slowly rotates underneath it. And this is actually one of the very first tools to ever demonstrate solid conclusion that the Earth is actually rotating. It is also said that the moon landing was actually faked. However, by simply visiting some observatories in the United States, some of them will have what are called the lunar laser ranging equipment. And these are laser beams that are actually sent out to the moon, which reflect off of these reflectors that were obviously placed by man that will bounce back to the Earth so that they can determine exactly the distance between this, the Earth and the moon. Obviously, these reflectors were placed by man, which indicates that man was indeed on the moon. Another common claim said by those who believe that the Earth is flat is that NASA is lying to us because throughout the years of taking photos of the Earth, the sizes of the continents tend to be different and therefore they must be lying to us. However, this is simply not true. Obviously, what plays a big role in the seemingly different sizes of the continents is the distance, position, and angle. And just to give you a, a, an example, we just seem to look at these three photos. Same, and all we have to do is simply change the position, angle, and distance, and we will see the same results. The size of the globe did not change. It's just simply your distance, position, and angle that has. With all this being said, I would like to present a friendly challenge to our flat earth friends and I mean this in the sincerest way. They say that NASA lies to us about the shape of the earth despite the fact that other countries have also taken photos of the earth and despite the fact that it was not NASA that found or discovered that the earth is actually a globe. So here's my challenge. Please present your proof of the flat earth. We have photos of the globe. You can call them CGI. You can call them all fake. But then please, the burden of proof is on you to present your proof of a flat earth. Show us the dome or show us the edge or fly out into space and show us the flat disk. This is what we really need to see. If the earth is indeed flat, then you must present your proof. The burden of proof is on you. So to finally conclude, 
The verses that we presented earlier in this video do not speak about the shape of the earth, not flat and not a globe. Instead, the verses that we presented are all speaking about the beautiful, habitable conditions of the earth. That is all that God is talking about. And it's important that we take these verses, as well as all of God's verses, at their face value without needing to extrapolate anything. And finally, the earth is a globe. To say otherwise is a denial of reality. It would also imply that other professions such as engineers or land surveyors or cartographers or GPS units or the military or geographers or, the, or pilots or many other professions that rely on the curvature of the earth are in some type of quote-unquote conspiracy, which is not the case whatsoever. So I hope, I pray, inshallah, this video has helped you understand the Qur'anic stance, at least in regards to the verses that we quoted. Those verses have nothing to do with the shape of the earth, but rather the habitable conditions of the earth, and to the fact that the earth is actually a globe. Wassalamu alaikum.